Uh, I'd like to thank the Simons Foundation for hosting this webinar uh, and for inviting me to give this talk. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule sheltering and <laughs> from your busy schedule sheltering in place to listen to this webinar. So uh, bats, cats, and coronaviruses, let's talk about COVID-19. So I'm gonna split this talk into three sections. The first section is going to be the satellite perspective on why are these diseases emerging in the first place and how can we prevent them? The uh, second perspective is the national perspective. And for those of you not in the United States, my apologies. Um, I'm going to focus on the United States. It's a very interesting, unique case study. Um, and then the third perspective is the household perspective or what can you do or what should you know about this virus to try to prevent from getting sick uh, and um, strategies for moving forward. So uh, let us begin with first the satellite perspective. Why are coronaviruses like SARS, MERS, and COVID-19 emerging? Well, to answer that question, we're going to use the One Health concept. And you may or may not have heard the One Health concept, but it's very simply is that human, animal, and environmental or ecosystem health are linked. Now that might seem obvious to many of you, uh, and indeed that's been intuitively understood by indigenous peoples around the world, uh, but it is generally not how we approach disease. We usually just focus on the humans. So this One Health concept that human, animal, and environmental or ecosystem health are linked provides a useful framework then for examining complex issues such as food security, emerging zoonotic diseases, and pandemics, and they are interrelated. Um, I will argue that we interact with our environment every day uh, simply by eating. We're ingesting our environment, whether it's meat and dairy products or uh, uh, crops as uh, fruits and vegetables. We ingest it literally into our bodies. Um, and that has profound implications for our health and well being. Uh, at the bottom of the screen is the OneHealthInitiative.com website. Um, it has been serving as a global repository for all news and information pertaining to One Health since 2008. It's a labor of love for me and my colleagues. My uh, colleague, Dr. Bruce Kaplan, is a retired veterinarian in Florida. He's our webmaster. He is very happy when we get lots of traffic. So please make Bruce happy. Visit our website. Tell your friends, family, and colleagues to visit our website. It's free. And again, again it's a labor of love for us. So please visit it. Uh, just a couple of shout outs. Um, if you are a teacher interested in One Health education, my colleague, Dr. Cheryl Stroud, has the One Health Initiative, or One Health Commission website, onehealthcommissionative.org. Um, there is, if you're in Europe, there's the One Health Platform website. They have One Health Congresses every two years. And if you're a student, there's a Facebook group, uh, International Students Alliance for One Health. Um, ISOHA, International Students for One Health. Uh, and there's a Facebook group, uh, One Health Approaches, that's international and very active as well. So please visit those. Uh, again, this is a, a passion project for many of us uh, and for many of my colleagues. So what is food security? Well, in its most basic form, it means no hungry people. This is a very important concept. Agriculture and the food security that it provides is the foundation of civilization. And we can't take our food for granted. It's built on three pillars, food availability, food access or affordability, as well as food use. It is so important, in fact, that the United Nations, when developing their sustainable development goals, made it number two as zero hunger. These are their goals to transform our world to become 
more sustainable for future generations. So let's put all of this into perspective. There are about seven and a half, 7.5 plus billion people. We have about 30 billion domesticated food animals and together they constitute about 96 to 98 percent of the total mammalian zoo mass on earth. Uh, we all need to eat. And with affluence comes the increasing demands for meat and other animal proteins. Uh, and this has profound implications for our planet. Um, we in the United States are one of the highest meat consumers per capita in the world. Uh, there are other countries that eat a lot of meat too, but we've been at the top. Now this graph goes until 2013. We're still near the top. Uh, but what's important to note is that China has been rapidly increasing with um, their development, uh, their, in, their ability to consume meat uh, and desire to consume meat has increased. Um, interestingly, India, which also has a billion people like China, their population, uh, their, uh, most of them, about 40%, are vegetarian. Um, and um, while both, oops, hold on a minute. While both China and India have over a billion people, it's China that's having these coronavirus spillover events, not India. Even though they both have over a billion people, they both have live animal markets, but China's got unique cultural features that make it particularly vulnerable for these spillover events. And I'll get to that in a minute. So the question we must ask with over 7.5 billion people, we want to eat meat. Um, the question is, is large scale animal agriculture ecologically sustainable? Now, uh, these animals didn't evolve to live in, by the thousands in these concentrated uh, facilities and their wastes build up. Um, and indeed, much of the environmental ecosystem destruction contamination is done either directly or indirectly for agriculture whether it's deforestation to make room for livestock farming we've got again millions of animals producing manure and in one paper by Berendus in nature sustainability last year estimated that um, 7.5 billion humans and 30 billion food animals produce around 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter each year. Now, uh, this fecal matter has to go somewhere for the uh, livestock. They often go into these large lagoons. It's a problem when you get a hurricane because then it starts flooding everywhere, including contaminating the local waters, the coastal waters, and the surrounding region affecting public health. Now we live in a microbial world. We need to learn how to live in it better. Microbes made our planets habitable. Microbe made Earth habitable by producing oxygen. It's also producing some of the greenhouse gases that are so hazardous to our climate. So for example, much of this manure uh, produces nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, about 300 times more potent than uh, carbon dioxide. So agriculture um, and its use of manure in agricultural fields has the risk of contaminating the soils, the waterways running off into the coastal waters, also producing these greenhouse gases, contributing then to climate change. So we live in a microbial world. These microbes make this connected the runoff of all the fecal matter goes into the coastal waterways, causing a uh, wildlife die off. So we need to learn how to live in our microbial world better. So with that in mind then, what do these scenes have in common? These are animals stacked on top of each other in a wet market. Uh, animals here again being sold in a wet market, intensive agricultural production. I had this originally planned for a Q&A in person, but uh, since um, I'm doing this by a webinar, I'm gonna take all of your questions at the end. 
But what's important to know about this pre what these scenes have in common is that they're breeding grounds for zoonotic diseases. And these are diseases of animals that spread between animals and humans. So many of these zoonotic diseases are emerging either directly or indirectly from our society's demand for meat and other animal proteins. So there are a number of zoonotic threats, and indeed about 60% of human pathogens are zoonotic. 75% of the newly emerging pathogens, such as SARS-CoV, uh, the original SARS in 2003, MERS, Ebola, HIV, 75% of them are zoonotic. And most of the agents of bioterrorism are zoonotic as well. And that's how I came into this field um, through looking at bioterrorism and realizing that there's this overlap between bioterrorism and emerging diseases, in that you've got, uh, they're all, most of them are zoonotic, and yet the physicians and the veterinarians do not generally talk to each other or collaborate, uh, and indeed um, have like a disconnect in terms of how we are approaching these microbes. So um, we have then an examples of these. Um, diseases are emerging around the world. Some of them are newly emerging, some of them are re-emerging, and unfortunately in the case of anthrax they are deliberately emerging. Um, but they're emerging not just from wild animals but historically from domestic animals as well. So measles, the common scourge in childhood, emerged from rinderpest centuries ago. And this um, pathogen rinderpest was a virus from cattle uh, and indeed we actually have uh, eradicated rinderpest the second disease to be eradicated after smallpox brucellosis is a bacterial infection from domesticated goats and sheep q fever and indeed and as well as uh, bovine sponge of form of cephalopathy mad cow also emerging from cattle now, if you uh, eat wild animals, also known as bushmeat, and that includes the bats and the civet cats uh, from the original SARS, uh, there's some thought that it might be related to pangolins in the current coronavirus, although it hasn't been uh, conclusively established. You have the danger of zoonotic disease transmission from wild animals, uh, including SARS, MERS, and COVID and who knows what's next down the line. Now this paper was posted in uh, the um, One Health Approaches Facebook group. As I said, it's very active. This paper was published in 2007 in Clinical Microbiology Reviews. It was a review paper on the SARS virus as an emerging and re-emerging infection, but the uh, conclusion the presence of a large reservoir of SARS-like, SARS-CoV-like viruses in horseshoe bats, together with the culture of eating exotic mammals in southern China, is a time bomb. So the knowledge of these, the recognition of these microbes emerging, or the threat of them emerging, has been known for a long time. But the problem is they often get published in these uh, scientific journals that don't get picked up by either the press and don't come to the attention of policymakers to do something about trying to prevent this. So what we wind up doing is basically putting out the viral fires every time they emerge, rather than trying to think strategically, how can we prevent these diseases from emerging in the first place, which is certainly much preferable than dealing with them after the fact. So you have fruit bats for sale, in parts of Africa, such as the Democratic Republic of Congo. You've got the wet markets in Wuhan, China. Uh, it's pictured here are different live animals being prepared for consumption. Now, these live animal markets are very popular in the tropics, and you can understand why. If they don't have refrigeration, then you want to make sure that your meat is as fresh as possible, so you want to see them killed. So, uh, it, it actually is a, um, a, a, a useful strategy uh, in a time before refrigeration. 
with refrigeration with that's available, uh, that's certainly preferable than um, having all of these animals congregated together, able to share microbes back and forth with each other. Now the pangolins are uh, these scaly anteater-like creatures. They're the most highly endangered, most trafficked mammal in the world. Their meat and scales are highly coveted in China. Uh, and again, believed to be the intermediate host of this uh, virus. And this uh, was a shipment of just tons of pangolin meat and scales uh, ready to be sold in China. So the food security challenges then in the 21st century, we have to recognize that people want to have protein and people need protein in order to be healthy. But we have to figure out how to meet everyone's protein needs without destroying our biodiversity and our ecosystems. So we need to figure out what policies then can governments implement to maximize our food security as well as our food safety. And we, uh, this is an incredibly important subject because as we must recognize, agriculture and the food security it provides is the foundation of our civilization and everything that we take for granted. So then what policies can governments implement to reduce the risk of more zoonotic diseases from spreading into people? Now, China temporarily banned the uh, sale of exotic or wild animals in their wild animal markets back in 2003, but then a black market appeared and people were skirting around getting those, uh, skirting around those rules. Um, they have now since implemented a temporary ban again on the sale of such meat, but whether or not they can actually permanently ban that, it's not easy to see if that's a, it's not necessarily a quick solution because you have to change the culture. And changing a culture is very difficult and we can't tell countries what they can or cannot eat, especially since we're one of the highest meat consuming countries here in the United States in the world, we really can't tell people what they can or cannot eat. They have to decide this for themselves. Um, in addition to um, implementing policies to reducing this risk, we need to do surveillance of animals for diseases or for the zoonotic microbes that might impact human health. So again, using this one health strategy, human, animal, and environmental health, we can't just focus on these microbes when they get into the humans. We need to track them beforehand. We have to look at the entire milieu in which we live. So now I'm going to switch gears and move into the national perspective, focusing on the United States. So what is the role of the federal government during a pandemic? This is a question I'd like to ask all of the middle school and high school students, since you're gonna be studying physics, uh, sorry, you will be studying physics, but civics as well. <laughs> um, you will be studying civics, and a very valid question then is, well, what is the role of the federal government during a pandemic? Because you should know. So the question then is, who's in charge? So to answer that question, we actually have to go back in time to when the U.S. Constitution was signed in 1787. So the U.S. Constitution guarantees the right to a lawyer, but not to a doctor. And why not do, they, do we have a right to a doctor? So to answer that, we have to go even further uh, to look at what was the status of medicine back in the 18th century. Well, the status of medicine back then was rather primitive, uh, and the doctors were more likely to cause you harm or death than benefit or cure. They resorted to lancets and to scarificators to bleed you, and indeed, poor George Washington's death was likely hastened by his physicians. At age 67, he had been remarkably healthy, but he became sick after horseback riding in a storm and his three doctors bled him, making him lose almost five pints of blood, which was not a good move for him. Uh, and unfortunately, he died shortly thereafter. So there was really no reason then for uh, 
there to be a right to a doctor back in 1787 because the doctors weren't going to help you. Um, and so that is largely why it's not a part of the Constitution. Now, of course, uh, with the uh, advance in science and the discovery of the germ theory of disease by Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, uh, you know, we learned then uh, how to practice medicine in a more scientific way. And now modern medicine uh, is able to uh, help you and in many cases cure you of, of many of these diseases. Um, but back then, again, it was uh, practice this Hippocratic medicine with the four humors um, lasting for 2,400 years of pure quackery with the belief that humoral imbalances caused illness. Um, and so really there was, again, no reason for there to be modern medicine or, or, or no reason there to, be the, to have the right to a doctor in the uh, late 18th century. So as a result, because there was no concept of modern medicine and public health wasn't really understood, um, the US Constitution then delegates the powers of public health by default to state and local uh, governments. Um, and that has its pluses and minuses because as we've learned through time, microbes don't necessarily respect political borders. Uh, and so as a result then, the US is a patchwork quilt of state public health laws, each state differing from the other. Um, so then what is the role of the federal government during a public health crisis? Well, the responsibility then, its role is primarily advisory and supportive, but that's incredibly important to be able to coordinate across all the states. We need to act together regionally rather than each little state by itself. Um, and the uh, country, the federal government, has to have the infrastructure and the experts in place to be able to provide expert advice to the states that don't necessarily have that level of expertise. So then the roles of the US president and Congress during an epidemic, well, Congress appropriates funds to the federal bureaucracy, or in the case that we've recently seen a, a trillion, $2 trillion uh, bailout package for people and businesses. The president is supposed to oversee the federal bureaucracy, and this uh, chief executive ideally appoints qualified leaders to head the departments and agencies that are responsible for emergency responses to things like pandemics. So you wanna have the best people in place. Who's in charge matters. It can literally mean the difference between life and death as to who you have voted for in office. So the federal bureaucracy most responsible for human, animal, and environmental health, for the human side of it, you've got the Department of Health and Human Services, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, the Food and Drug Administration. CDC does mostly public health surveillance, coordinating disease reports in, from the states. Food and Drug Administration oversees food safety from uh, the gate of the farm to your plate. The US Department of Agriculture actually oversees the livestock and crops. The Food and Drug Administration also oversees um, the, uh, it um, uh, has to validate the tests that are being given, uh, authorize the use of tests, or in the case that of most recently, waiving the requirement of FDA approval so that uh, states can then go on to develop their own tests, uh, as well as the National Institutes of Health, which does uh, the research on human uh, diseases. Uh, the Department of the Interior oversees wildlife, and that includes the US Geological Survey and the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which primarily do uh, surveillance of uh, the fish and the game that people are interested in hunting. Uh, and then the Environmental Protection Agency mostly focuses on contamination levels, not necessarily on the, uh, the wildlife. So again, this is 
the Centers for Disease Control, collects disease surveillance reports from the states, investigates disease outbreaks, but only when the states ask for help. They can't just go in on their own. They have to be invited in by the states, and some states are more willing to ask for help than others. Um, they also provide treatment and prevention information to the nation's healthcare providers and to the public health professionals. So their role is extremely important for providing expert advice uh, and for uh, collecting surveillance so we know what's going on on the national level. Uh, and unfortunately, they have not been fulfilling that role very well in this crisis. Uh, and most of the data that's now being used is from Johns Hopkins University. They have a coronavirus resource center that people are referring to. Again, the US Department of Health and Human Services, Food and Drug Administration, they evaluate the safety and efficacy of drugs, vaccines, biological products. They collect and analyze adverse reactions or problem reports and they authorize the diagnostic lab tests, such as the COVID-19 test that was initially bungled by uh, the CDC's initial rollout of their test. So then, in other words, the governors and the mayors are in charge during epidemics. So Andrew Cuomo has really risen to the occasion and has been an excellent governor in terms of responding to this crisis in New York State. Uh, and Bill de Blasio is the New York City mayor overseeing what's been going on in New York City. So to give you an example of the importance of political and public health leadership at the local level, I have two outbreaks here. One is the smallpox outbreak of 1947 in New York City and the smallpox outbreak of 1894 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So the 1947 New York City outbreak uh, happened right after World War II. Public trust in government was at an all-time high. Uh, the mayor at the time was William O'Dwyer, and he appointed Dr. Israel Weinstein as his commissioner of health. And when a out smallpox outbreak was confirmed, Dr. Weinstein notified the public immediately assembled a team to develop a response plan. Dr. Uh, Mayor O'Dwyer gave his political support for Dr. Weinstein's decision to implement a mass education and vaccination campaign. And in fact, Mayor O'Dwyer even very publicly let Dr. Weinstein vaccinate him with a press photo at the same time. The, uh, the uh, health department had a sterling reputation they had the press go to them to make sure that any kind of rumors were squelched uh, so that the information was as factual as possible in the press. Thousands of people volunteered to help. And in less than a month, 6 million people were vaccinated. 12 people got uh, smallpox and two people died. Now, unfortunately, there were this, the smallpox vaccine was quite toxic and they did have 46 cases of encephalitis or inflammation of the brain. So this wasn't a, a benign vaccine by any stretch of the imagination. Now let's contrast this with the 1894 smallpox outbreak in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. At that time, the mayor was John C. Cook or Koch, uh, and he appointed Dr. Walter Kempster as the health commissioner. And as smallpox cases began to increase, Dr. Kempster began giving false reassurances to the public that everything was under control. The local newspaper, the Milwaukee Sentinel, noted that most cases were in Polish immigrants on the south side of town. There were rumors spreading about brutality in the communicable disease hospital. They had differing policies depending on who you were, poor people were forced to go to the hospital while wealthy people were allowed to stay in their homes if they got smallpox. And as a result, riots then broke out for the entire month of August. And a year later, after this outbreak began, almost 900 people got smallpox and 244 people died. So I would argue that that was a 
an example of what not to do. The common mistake that uh, elected officials make, providing false reassurances that everything's under control, minimizing the severity of the outbreak, or finding a scapegoat to blame for the outbreak are all counterproductive to responding. And ultimately, the key for any good public health response for, for leadership is trust. You have to be able to trust the person who you voted for to have your uh, best uh, health, your well being in mind. That must be their top priority. These people have to be honest and they have to be transparent if they want to have a public that's willing to follow their recommended policies. You can have the best vaccine in the world, but if the public doesn't trust the vaccine or trust you, they're not going to be willing to accept it. So trust is absolutely critical for any type of response and in particular, a public health response. So when the state and local governments are overwhelmed, well, then we have to call in the National Guard or FEMA to uh, assist the, the, uh, the locals, which we are actually starting to see now. So let me now switch uh, to the third perspective, the household perspective. How can you protect yourself and your family? So uh, for those of you who have no background in microbiology, just a very quick recap on what we're dealing with. For those of you who are expert in this, my apologies. Um, zoonotic diseases, diseases of animals that infect people can include viruses, they can include bacteria, they can include fungi, parasites or worms, uh, and even prions, which are misfolded proteins. For the sake of this talk and for time, I'm only going to talk about viruses because that's what this coronavirus is. It's a virus. And so viruses are basically a lipid uh, membrane, a coat, if you will, with all of these little projections sticking out of the coat. Uh, these are the proteins. And that's what gives the coronavirus its name. It's got all these little projections that the scientists thought looked like a crown. You can see an image of that here. It looks a little bit like a crown. It's basically a protein, a protein coat surrounding genetic material, in this case, uh, RNA. Uh, you can also have DNA viruses, but in, this, in the case of the coronavirus, it's RNA. Genetic material. They are technically not alive. So why do you think that viruses are not alive? Well, to answer that, um, what makes, what's the definition of being alive? Well, uh, nor normally somebody who's alive is somebody who eats, who uh, eliminates, and who reproduces by themselves. So bacteria do that. Bacteria are living beings uh, and the other microbes, except for the prions, which are just proteins, are living beings. They eat, they eliminate, and they reproduce. But that's not what viruses are. I have a picture here of the coronavirus again, what we're dealing with, Ebola and SARS. So viruses are basically parasites. And what they do is they get into your body, uh, they attach themselves with their protein projections, they insert their genetic material into the cell, and then they turn the cell into a virus-making machine or a production facility, if you will. So they replicate the genetic material of the virus, takes over the machinery of your cell, and makes it start becoming a virus factory. Uh, and so then you start producing the viral particles, the virus then bursts out of the cell, on to affect the, infect the next cell. And this process keeps repeating uh, until your immune system hopefully is able to come along and uh, overwhelm it and basically block it and rid it from your body. So because viruses are technically not alive, that means they cannot be killed. So antibiotics, which only work against bacteria, do not work. 
Now, what antiviral medications do is they block the activity of the virus. They don't cure you of the infection, they block their activity to give your immune system a chance to be able to intercede and to get rid of it. Uh, the best option in the case of viral infections then is vaccination. So vaccines are made, and they, you can have vaccines against both viral and bacterial diseases, but they are in essence either deactivated viruses or pieces of viruses, something of the virus that provides target practice for your immune system. It needs to be able to recognize it in order to be able to mount a, uh, an army, a full-on response to rid your body before it becomes overwhelmed with the microbe. So it primes your immune system to fight the invasion from the virus. And that's actually much more effective than trying to block it after the fact, after it's already entered your body. So that's why vaccines are so important. Now, how do viruses spread? It depends on the particular virus. Um, for Ebola virus, it's usually blood and bodily fluids. Uh, and people who are infected with Ebola uh, have propulsive projectile vomiting. You know, this virus really wants to make the body as uh, communicable as possible so it can get to the next host. So many of the symptoms that you develop, whether coughing or sneezing, is the virus's attempt to get out of your body to go infect the next person. Measles is highly infectious and can uh, last in the air for a long time, hours. So you can walk into a room where there was somebody with measles an hour earlier and still be exposed and you would have no idea. So viruses can also spread by contaminated water and food by mosquitoes and other insects, blood and other bodily fluids, and contaminated fomites such as door handles, shopping cart, uh, shopping cart handles, uh, anything that's uh, plastic or porous or metal, uh, the virus can survive for, uh, at least this coronavirus can survive on these surfaces for about three days. So the other important concept is the incubation period, the time between when you're exposed to the virus and when you uh, come down with the illness. Uh, it varies again from virus to virus, uh, but the incubation period for this, uh, this particular coronavirus it ranges from two to 14 days. So after you get exposed to it, uh, it takes about two to 14 days for you to start developing the symptoms. The most common symptom is a high fever, a dry cough, you get difficulty breathing, muscle pains, and fatigue. So the reason why we have people go into quarantine for two to four, for 14 days, because that's believed to be the maximum amount of time for the incubation period, to make sure that if this person is uh, infectious, that they stay out of uh, the social milieu, if you will, uh, to reduce the risk of infecting somebody else. So another really important term is R0. R0 is the basic reproductive number of a virus. And it very simply means uh, if you've, uh, the number of people that one sick person can infect. So it, the higher the number, the more contagious than the microbe. So for this current COVID-19, the R0 is estimated to be somewhere around 2.3, meaning that one sick person is on average uh, expected to infect a little over two people, from two to maybe three people. It is believed to be a bit more infectious than the flu. Um, so, so the only way to get this outbreak to be contained is you want to get R0 to be less than one. You want one sick individual to not infect anybody. Now, a very effective way of doing that is with vaccines, because if you have uh, what's called herd immunity, or the number of people around the one sick person are all vaccinated and immune, uh, then you've broken the chain of transmission. So in this first box, if nobody's vaccinated and different levels of percents of vaccination, I'm going to hit this button now, and you can see how it spreads. 
Um, so the higher the percent vaccinated, the, the less that this uh, microbe can spread. Uh, and so uh, for something like measles, which is, has an R naught of 12 to 18, meaning one person can infect 12 to 18 other people, having a very high vaccination rate or herd immunity is essential if you want to uh, contain the outbreak. We have a very effective vaccine for measles. Again, it's a matter of public trust, whether they trust the vaccine, whether or not the information about it was fraudulent. Uh, once that misinformation gets out into the public, it's very hard to undo. And unfortunately, right now, there's no vaccine for this COVID-19 virus, uh, and there probably won't be one for at least a year because it takes time to figure out what piece of the virus serves as the best target practice for your immune system. It has to be safe and it has to be effective, otherwise it's useless. So without a vaccine, which is the situation we're in now, we need to have separation measures in order to get the R naught less than one so that one sick person doesn't infect anybody else. So by sheltering in place, we restrict the activities of everyone to break the chain of transmission, which I hope all of you are in. Quarantine is set different. Um, you restrict the activities of people who are presumed to be exposed to the microbe until the incubation period of two weeks ends. Now, unfortunately, this COVID-19 virus, like the flu, can be transmissible by people who aren't even showing any signs or symptoms. And so that means that uh, being able to contain it is that much more difficult. The original SARS in 2003 could only be transmitted by people who were very sick. Uh, and that is how we were able to contain it without a vaccine. Uh, people were, most of the people who got sick were actually the healthcare workers. For the people who are healthy, we want to isolate them in uh, either a hospital isolation room or isolate them at home if they're not so sick that they need to be in the hospital. Uh, again, if they're very sick, they might even have to go into the in intensive care unit for uh, support breathing with a ventilation. Now, ideally, if we did widespread testing, we could then identify in the, if we did testing of the entire population, you could identify then those who are infected. You can identify those who are infected and who are asymptomatic. You can identify those who are infected and symptomatic, and then you can isolate them. Uh, for people who have recovered and are immune, you can then test them to see if they have antibodies. If they have antibodies for the virus, they are indeed immune, and they can go back to work. They're not going to be spreading this virus. Um, and so there's no reason really for people who are immune to be sheltering in place or to be uh, prohibited from working. But again, we have to be very careful about telling who's able to go back to work or not. It's best done with an antibody test. Uh, for those who are elderly or chronically ill, um, we don't want to risk them getting this virus because their rate of mortality goes up. Uh, and we have to be, uh, make sure that they are protected, uh, which is why we need to quarantine those who are, uh, in, who are infected, but not necessarily sick. Now, the countries have uh, varied tremendously in terms of the number of tests performed per million people. And uh, the United Arab Emirates, according to our world in data, as of March 16th, by far uh, have performed the most tests, uh, and if you go down the line, uh, we are down here uh, towards the bottom of the, uh, of the graph. We have not done very many testing because we've been very late out of the starting block, uh, unfortunately. So um, the actual number of people in this country uh, is, is who are infected is, is still unknown. Now, in terms of the death rate from the coronavirus, we have very good data from South Korea. They tested um, 357,000 people uh, and they had 9,000 confirmed cases. So the death rate, if you take it as a ratio of death plus recovered, was about 3.2% versus death versus all of them confirmed, 
is about 1.2%. So the death rate ranges then, again, depending on how you define it uh, and depending on who your population is. The, the bottom line is all of us are vulnerable, but the old, particularly those who are 80 and over, are the most vulnerable. And the case fatality rate increases with age. So we really want to protect the people who are most vulnerable to this. Now, in comparison to other viruses, um, this is the current, not the current coronavirus that we're dealing with. The mortality rate is on average around 2.1% if you average it across the, um, the different spectrum. The Spanish flu of 1918, mortality rate about 2.5%. When SARS, the original SARS came out in 2003, the death rate was about 9.5%. Fortunately, that virus was not as communicable as the current one we're dealing with. Um, that one was only um, communicable by people who were, who were sick. MERS was even more lethal with a mortality rate of 34% and on down the line. Again, it depends on your population at risk. It depends on your healthcare system, uh, how well it is able to handle the influx of, of sick people. So uh, all of you, I am sure, are sheltering in place. You want to make sure that you have food, medicine, and supplies for two to four weeks. And who knew that toilet paper was so critical to our health and well-being that uh, the shelves are just completely sold out? Uh, in our local market, uh, I was told that the toilet paper came in at 6 a.m. and by 7 a.m. it was gone. So if you want your toilet paper, you have to go into the market really early. You want to make sure that you wash your hand for 20, hands for 20 seconds to make sure that you uh, get rid of the microbes, particularly the virus that might be lurking there, and definitely don't touch your eyes or your mouth after touching a public service surface like a uh, doorknob or a subway pole. Additional preventive measures for those who are 65 years and older, make sure you get your flu shot. Now the flu season's waning now, but uh, you don't want to get the coronavirus and the flu at the same time. Uh, we have a vaccine against the flu. None of the vaccines are 100% effective, but they're better than nothing. The other thing that you want to do is you want to get your pneumonia shot or the PPSV23 shot, uh, and that helps reduce the risk of developing a bacterial pneumonia after, if you do get this coronavirus, it's going to disrupt the biome, the microbiome in your body, uh, making you more vulnerable than to getting, developing a, uh, a pneumococcal pneumonia. So that is, again, a preventive that you want to have on board your body to, um, sorry, to, uh, to protect yourself. So uh, if you do get sick, uh, call your doctor, get tested. You want to identify, hopefully the tests are going to become more available soon. Again, the symptoms are dry cough, fever, nausea, vomiting, and shortness of breath. Uh, basically, it's symptomatic relief. Fluids are extremely important. Uh, chicken noodle soup is, is, is called the Jewish penicillin. It's very effective, actually, in providing you with the, uh, the salts and the nutrients that your body needs to fight this type of infect, to fight this infection. Uh, in terms of the number of confirmed COVID cases, when I first put this talk together uh, back in uh, earlier in March, this was the profile of the country where you had just a couple states, uh, particularly the coastal states, New York, California, and Washington, having the most cases. Uh, and now, um, as of 20, the 24th, a couple days ago, you can see that the virus has now spread across the entire country and continues to, do, and continues to increase. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, the CDC was slow to issue laboratory test, test kits, and they were problematic, they were faulty, and did not give accurate results. But by the end of February, the FDA uh, allowed qualified labs around the country to develop their own tests. So after this rule change, then widespread testing, widespread testing can begin, but again, we're uh, slow, off, slow off the starting block, unfortunately. Um, so the take-home messages, messages then are 
from the satellite perspective, we need to figure out how to meet our protein needs without unleashing more zoonotic diseases upon ourselves. We need to use a One Health approach, looking at humans, animals, and the environment, looking at the entire milieu in order to develop effective policies. At the national perspective, in the US, it's governors and mayors that are in charge. And under current circumstances, that's a good thing. The federal government's role is advisory and supportive unless the state and local governments are overwhelmed and need assistance. And from your household perspective, then you want to have foods, medicines, and essential supplies for at least two to four weeks, get your flu shot, and wash your hands. Uh, so we need to figure out how to feed ourselves sustainably. We need to learn how to live in our microbial world better. And we need to integrate our efforts to benefit humans, animals, and our, or, and our planet's ecosystems. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators with the One Health Initiative, Dr. Kaplan, Tom Monath, Lisa Conti, Tom Ewell, Helena Chapton, Chapman, and Dr. Craig Carter. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention. <music>